Oh, hello there. I didn't even see you there. How have you been lately? Because me, I've been very busy lately preparing something that involves patterns. So, without much further ado, let me take you to my presentation all about patterns. Hello, hello everyone. So today we'll now be looking at patterns. And so some of these stylings you may have seen before, whether you're walking around the buildings or any other forms in life, maybe from other designs or maybe like also from architecture as well. So here are some examples of familiar patterns that you may have seen throughout your whole lives, which may be from walking around the house or anywhere in general as well. It's now, here are more examples of familiar patterns. You just notice how the streaks of those patterns are being made and the directions of these shapes are being stroked as well. So one of these designs here include a kaleidoscope down here. It's just by seeing with some reflections and mirrors, it could also create a lot of imagery as well. Even also in this walling here, it may just be simple, but it's maybe a copy and paste of reflections given as well. And now for my next clip, we'll be sh I'll be sharing a screen sh share from The Shining. You notice from the flooring here, it may also have some familiar patterns with it as well, on the way it was stroke or the way the pattern was being made as well. It may so be some type of a design aesthetic or a way or a method on how the artist creates the pattern. So as we say, patterns are everywhere. But there is a specific scope among these patterns. Just so by looking at these patterns, we may know like, oh, it goes on this stroke or, oh, it's being made on this stroke or it may be just in the creative imagery of one's artist. But well, these patterns have a known scope and they also have a name in general as well. They are called wallpaper groups. From seeing from the term of wallpaper groups, we now move on to the definition of what is wallpaper groups. A wallpaper group is a mathematical classification of a two-dimensional repetitive pattern. And wallpaper groups are also known as crystalline symmetric groups. And now we move on to the brief history of wallpaper groups. So a brief history of wallpaper groups. So. We take note of these notable people, Schoenflies, Fedorov, and Barlow. So in the late 19th century, Fedorov, Schoenflies, and Barlow classified the 17 wallpaper groups or the two-dimensional crystallographic groups and the 323-dimensional crystallographic groups, namely 5, 7, 6, 27, and 1. And now the most notable person in the terms of wallpaper groups, Escher. So Dutch artist Moritz Cornelis Etcher used these groups in creating his intriguing interlocking repeated patterns to know our deeper scope in the topic of the day. So now we'll be talking about the 17 classifications of wallpaper groups. And for each will be a brief description to each of the 17 wallpaper groups given in this presentation. So we go on to symmetry group number one. Symmetry group number one is named P1. This is the simplest symmetry group. It consists only of translations. There are neither reflections, grid reflections, nor rotations. The two translation axes may be inclined at any angle to each other. Its lattice is parallelogrammatic. So a fundamental region for the symmetry group is the same as that for the translation group, namely a parallelogram. 
So you may have noticed here that there may be different designs or these designs are relatively individual in each tile given. Symmetry group two will be named P2. This group differs only from P1 in that it contains 180 degree rotations. That is, rotations of order two. As in all symmetry groups, there are translations, but there are neither reflections nor glide reflections. The true translations axis may be inclined at any angle to each other. So this group has a pair within each other as now as well. Symmetry group three, or named PM. This group contains reflections. The angles of reflections are parallel to one axis of translation and perpendicular to the other axis of translation. The lattice is rectangular. There are neither rotations nor glide reflections. Symmetry group four is named PG. This group contains glide reflections. The direction of the glide reflection is parallel to one axis of translation and perpendicular to the other axis of translation. There are neither rotations nor reflections, such as this design here. Symmetry group five or is named the CM. This group contains reflections and glide reflections with parallel axis. There are no rotations in this group. The translations may be inclined at any angle to each other, but the axis of the reflections bisect the angle formed by the translation. So the lattice is rhombic, such as these ones here as well. Symmetry group six is named PMM. This symmetry group contains perpendicular axis of reflection with 180 degree rotations where the axis intersects, such as these lines here, they intersect within each other at one panel at a time. Symmetry group seven is named PMG. So this group here contains reflections and glide reflections, which are perpendicular to the reflection axis. It has rotations of order two on the glide axis, halfway between the reflection axis. Symmetry group eight is named PGG. This group contains no reflections, but it has glide reflections and 180 degree rotations. There are perpendicular axes for the glide reflections and the rotation centers do not lie on the axis here. So symmetry group number nine is CMM. This group has perpendicular reflection axis as does group PMM, but it has also additional rotations of order two. Centers of the additional rotations do not lie on the reflection axis. Symmetry group 10 or P4. This group has a 90 degree rotation. That is a rotation of order four. It also has rotations of order two. The centers of the order two rotations are midway between the centers of the order four rotations. So there are no reflections on a pattern like this. In symmetry group 11 or P4M. This group also has both order two and order four rotations. This group has four axes of reflection. The axis of reflection are inclined to each other by 45 degrees so that four axes of reflection pass through each other through order four rotation center. Every rotation center lies on some reflection angles. There are also two glide reflections passing through each order two rotation with axis at 45 degrees to the reflection axis. P4M is very common and it's easy to recognize because of its square axis. It's easily recognizable just by looking at these squared lines. So symmetry group 12 or the P4G. So like P4, this group contains reflections and rotations of orders two and four. There are two perpendicular reflections passing through each 
order to rotation. However, the order for rotations do not lie on any reflection axis. There are four directions of glide reflections in this one. So symmetry group 13 or P3. So this is the simplest group that contains a 120 degree rotation. That is a rotation of order three. It has no reflections or glide reflections. So we move on to symmetry group 14 or P31M. This group contains reflections whose axes are inclined at 60 degrees to one another and rotations of order three. Some of these centers of rotation lie on the reflection axis and some do not. There are some glide reflections though. Symmetry group 15, P3M1. This group is similar to the last in that it contains reflections in order three rotations. The axis of the reflections are again inclined at 60 degrees to one another. But for this group, all of the centers of rotation do lie on the reflection axis. There are some glide reflections though. Symmetry group 16 or P6. This group contains 60 degrees rotations, that is, rotations of order six. It also contains rotations of orders two and three, but no reflections or glide reflections in here. So symmetry group 17, or the P6M, this complex group has rotations of order two, three, and six, as well as reflections. The axis of reflection meet at all the centers of rotation. At the centers of the order six rotations, six reflection axes meet and are inclined at 30 degrees to one another. There are some glide reflections here. Though. For further understanding about the different wallpaper groups, I have here a simulation called mathhomeworks.edu about creating the different wallpaper symmetry. So from this grid, I'm going to draw here a simple line. And from this design, it represents P1 or symmetry group 1, P1. However, even though it's just only about P1, it's different from the different wallpaper groups, such as let's click on PG or any other wallpaper group symmetry. See? So we see here is that it may be different for all types of wallpaper groups out there. We have P2, PMM, P4, P4M. Look at this structure, it's like a box. P4G, this one also has a cross design as well. And even this one as well, it's kind of unique. It's a triangular design or a hexagonal design as well. So they're all different and unique in just from a single line of P1. Well, for further knowledge and understanding to the other wallpaper groups as well, let's try a line in CM. And in this case, two lines show up as well. Kind of rotate here as well. Let's try drawing on P4. Let's try drawing a line on P4. It kind of forms like a box up in here. Or just by looking at their direction, it kind of looks symmetric or something. It's because it's also one of the rules in wallpaper groups about having a specific dimension or a lines built up. See, we have a triangle here. It could also be from a letter Y shape or just a plain triangular shape. We just notice on how drawing some single lines with just different rules of symmetry groups would just mean that there could be much more creativity in creating a design here. We now move on to the highlight of our presentation. What is the relevance of wallpaper groups in the modern world nowadays? As we move on to our presentation, we now move on to the main point of this presentation. What is the relevance of wallpaper groups in the modern world nowadays? So now we go on to this main point for four reasons. 
the relevances of wallpaper groups. We go on to these four main points. First is the usage of design and embellishment. Second is the relevance to mathematics. The third is the creation of the pieces or the process on how the wallpaper group is made. And the fourth would be the recognition of logic with mathematical ability among these designs. So, for design and embellishment, so like as mentioned earlier, designs are everywhere. We may see beauty in logical things, but the beauty we see is selective, meaning we could consider things on what's appealing to us. So wallpaper groups have a relevance in designing to add such aesthetic to a person's site. Ranging from a minimal de decoration to a fully renovated one, no matter how big or small that change is. As long as there's the design, then it's design. And now, the next point would be its relevance to mathematics. So not only it's for design and arts, but also they are relevant in the course of mathematics as well. It's relevant on how such calculations are made to formulate symmetric designs to follow on a plane surface. It's relevant on how the shapes are measured, the strokes are made, and the area of the wallpaper being placed in such to avoid OCD in a person's view. Now to the process. Wallpapers can be made, whether traditionally or digitally. But in this video, it's shown on how the wallpaper groups are made traditionally. Most groups nowadays are created digitally with modern technology to multiply and scale some designs in a much more efficient time. These patterns may be created rationally, but also rely on the person's creative thinking as well. Wow, look at all these designs right here, huh? It's really appealing. And finally, it's recognition to mathematical ability. Wallpaper groups are much understandable in the study concepts of geometry and angles. People may see only design, but other people see beyond the surface and analyze it on what wallpaper group design is it, whether it may be P1, PM, or PMG, or, and so on and so forth of other wallpaper groups. And that gives in much more meanings on the purpose of creating wallpaper groups that's not analyzed based on its exterior design but also on its measurements and calculations as well. So I just learned from today that wallpaper groups is a creative but rational pattern. As you can see here from my book, I was just observing how these patterns came to be so aesthetic but at the same time so symmetric with each other like this pattern here and another one that i've seen also this one here as well like whoa how does this have a creative eye and at the same time a logical brain as well to make these It uses all parts of your brain, like it's not only limited to the left brain or the right brain, like the logic side and the artistic side, but it's a combination of both. And it could also be a great training as well when you're trying to make wallpaper groups in your own imagery as well. I just came up with this random question. If the idea of wallpaper groups had never existed, then what would have been other subject areas that could also be about patterns, designs, and measurement at the same time? I wonder what it would be. Thank you so much for your time in watching my presentation about wallpaper groups and its relevance to the modern world. My name is Jose Gabriel A. Saulog, more known as RG Saulog, and this is my presentation. Thank you so much for watching.